First, I want to thank Mr. George Veronakis and Craig and everyone, everyone working here. It's an amazing like, production, very extensive. <laughs> it feels like I'm at the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You don't see it, but it's going on. <laughs> and uh, I want to deeply, deeply thank them for inviting me to come and teach for you guys and share uh, some knowledge. And my wish, my very, very biggest wish in the world is that after these three days, you guys feel so empowered and so ready to kick some butt. And uh, I just want to expand knowledge and share it and uh, help this whole community of photographers grow. I especially also want to thank my six awesome, super cool, super duper students in the live audience that came from all over the place. And uh, you guys had to fly in, some of you. Some of you just drove for 10 minutes. Um, but thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, as you know, I don't know if you guys know, uh, when I'm teaching, I'm a little bit of a strict teacher. So having these guys as the live audience, is, they're very brave. So they're the brave ones. Um, I wanted to basically start out quickly with an introduction of everybody so we can all get to know each other. The, most importantly, when the students, when the live audience is telling you what their struggles are and what they, what they just are tired of feeling this awful feeling in their stomach when they're about to photograph or, or if you ever feel a sense of disappointment when you come back from a photo shoot or do you ever look at somebody else's work and be like, why can't I get to that point? But what, does I have, what do I have to do? I mean, I'm a human. I got arms. I got legs. I got eyes. Why can't I do that? Right? And especially all of you out there who are struggling to pay bills or rent or, or mortgage or whatever, and photography is your job, uh, that's the worst feeling in the world. And I have good news for you, which we'll expand on that later. But I feel like there's a solution to financial problems when it comes to photography. So um, I want to start with my good friend, Fran, who I just met. <laughs> And I wanted to basically ask you guys to tell me where you're from. Tell me why you decided to do photography. What drew you into this, into this crazy, crazy industry? Uh, by the way, I am from Mexico City, so I say crazy with an S, not crazy with a Z. <laughs> like, I can't even pronounce that word. So just bear with me. It's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> okay. um, there's lots of stuff I can't pronounce, but I'll try. <laughs> okay. So tell me why you decided to be in this industry, and especially tell me what are your struggles? What are the things you want to achieve? What are the things that are inside of you just burning up and you're like frustrated about when it comes to your photography okay. uh, business? So this is Fran, everybody. Woo! <laughs> Hi, I'm oh, Fran. Fran. How's it going? Um, well, I started photography. I, my background's in counseling, and I was doing that for way too long, and uh, I've been having a few conversations about that. Anyway, so I decided. Where am I looking? I decided to. Um, to get into photography because um, you know when you're really passionate about something but it's, some, it's never at the forefront, um, I was sick and tired of putting what I was really passionate about in the back burner so I decided that I was just going to step out and um, get into photography and just uh, give it a shot, you know, you got to be in it to win it so mm -hmm. that's kind of how it started. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of struggling, I've been struggling a lot with the whole lighting aspect. Um, I do a lot of on location photography for the most part and so um, your workshop's pretty spot on in that um, it's all about location and posing and so forth. And I don't work with a lot of models. I work with a lot of like aspiring models or just the everyday person. And so um, it's really hard to be able to direct people um, that don't have experience. And usually when it's like a first photo shoot, you find that they're really nervous in front of the camera. So the first like hour or so forth is usually um, nothing that you can use. And so um, I'm hoping that I can you know, nail it and just learn from you. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you. Pepe. Hi, Roberto. From San Francisco. Area. Well, my, my name is Pepe Abarca, and I'm from California. I'm originally from Guadalajara, Mexico, which is uh, the second largest city, uh, as opposed to the uh, Mexico City. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've come from a criminal justice, a, a sociology background, which uh, I had been doing all my, my life. And I, about four years ago, I, I picked up a camera and um, started you know just doing as a hobby and then I did my uh, best friend's uh, wedding you know he asked me to his wedding you know he was a, uh, was in a budget so I said ah, why not you know I'll give it a try you know you know I wasn't charging you know, so I was like you know, if I messed up I mess up you know no pressure and I fell in love with it and I've been doing that ever since I 
I usually do uh, wedding photography on, on location photography. So, um, but I struggle a lot in posting. It's, you know, it's, most weddings are, you know, uh, photojournalism type of sh shooting. But when it comes to the, like, the, the formal portraits, we have to, you know, try to post them. I struggle a lot. So I'm glad I'm here with Roberto, uh, which I met before. And um, I know she's a great teacher, so super excited to be here. So we're happy to have you, Pepe. It's a good time. Yeah. We're happy to have you. Oh, thank you. Nikki. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Nikki Klosser, and I live mm -hmm. here in Seattle, and I have been a social worker for the last 10 years, and I'm used to interacting with people um, and dealing with emotion, and what I was sort of finding is I'm passionate about working with people, but I, I was kind of starting to feel just down after 10 years of trying to solve people's problems, and I do quite a bit of traveling, and um, I would take photos, and I liked them, but I just thought they, I don't know, I just decided they weren't that great, and so one day I picked up my husband's camera, and um, I loved it, and I fell in love with it. So uh, that was in December, and I was kicking myself for not doing this sooner. Um, so in terms of what I struggle with, I mean, obviously there's always room for growth in every area, but living in Seattle, we have such amazing backgrounds and amazing locations to shoot, but clients often ask to shoot in really busy areas, really popular busy areas, and so I kind of want to make sure I'm using those locations in the best way possible without just having a background where I lose my clients in the background. So um, yeah, location, location, and, and also posing, posing and execution, off-camera lighting. I mean, there's always room for growth, so I'm excited. I know you're an awesome teacher. Mm -hmm. Watched you at WPPI, read your book, so this is going to be great. Thank you. You said something really important. Losing your clients in the background, mm -hmm. that's, we'll discuss. Great. Uh, there's a, there's a really big uh, misconception about beauty in the background mm -hmm. and how you use it and how you incorporate it in a photograph. When you're photographing, it's a different story than when you're looking at it with your eyes. When you're looking at a scene with your eyes, it can be beautiful. When you're photographing, that scene has to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is beyond its, 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 its beauty. It, it needs to play a role with your subjects. Right. And if you don't make that connection, that background becomes a distraction because they're, they're, it's, it's a pretty background and it could be pr just as pretty as your subjects and you compete. Mm -hmm. To me, photography is like so much fun. It's like a game. It's just like competing with myself and competing with the surroundings and competing with who's competing with my subjects. If anyone's competing with my subjects, I'm going to take them out. <laughs> see what I mean? So there's no question, no doubt in anybody's mind when they see my, my work that my subjects are the star of the show. Nothing, no matter how cool the location is, they're going to be the star of the show somehow. And that's something, it's like a little science. We'll discuss all that later on. Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Good. Juliana? My name is Juliana Goldberg. I'm originally from Brazil, and I live in Henderson, 15 minutes away from Las Vegas trip. Um, I just need to say hi to my daughter and my son. She thinks I'm on iCarly. So hi, Lillian Max. And hi, my Skip Summer School friends. Um, I love photography, I always loved, and since I had my kids, I pretty much held that camera really close to me and taking pictures all over and over and over. And I discovered that um, my passion for photography was much bigger than I expected. So I've been studying and working, and I struggle a lot to pose in couples. That's one of my main things, putting the subjects together. It's kind of a puzzle for me. I met Roberto Skip, and I love your work, and I can't wait to go through these three days. So that's about it. That'll be good. Thank you. Hello, Mallory. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Mallory, and I have Mallory Renee Photography. Um, I got into photography when um, I was watching my wedding photographer do her thing, and I just thought that was so cool. And like, how fun would that be to just go to weddings all the time and get paid for it. I'm like, that's a dream job. And um, so I went out and got my first camera and started practicing. And um, so, but what I struggle with, oh, I'm from Southern Utah and I have two, three kids, by the way. Um, so it really um, helps me to kind of be able to do my own thing and have sort of a job, and, um, but also be home with my children. 
Um, but I think that the thing I'm struggling with the most is, you know, every wedding location is different, obviously. And so it's kind of scary going into each wedding location and wondering, am I going to be able to pull this off? Is it going to be pretty? Whatever. And so I don't quite have the confidence yet to go into any location and feel like I can master it. And that's really what I want to come away with. So. That's my you goal. You have kids? I do have kids. You look like you're like super young. Well, I have <laughs> two step kids, so that's oh, okay. kind of how, yeah. So oh, I have okay. one of my own and two step kids, so ah. I didn't start very young. <laughs> 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 Why didn't you say that to me? <laughs> you too, I, I don't know. It's like, wow, I need to get going on that department. Hi, my name is David, David. Aj. I'm based in Phoenix, Arizona. and. Ooh. I'm new to the exciting world of photography for a living. Well, exciting, terrifying, same difference. So, um, I've More been terrifying shooting, sometimes. Yeah. I've been shooting for a little while. I've always had photography in my life, even though I come from an IT background. But in the past seven years, it's become something that, it's something of an addiction. If I don't shoot for a little while, I start getting withdrawal. And so I knew this is something I needed to do for a living. And um, I'm really passionate about it. I've done a lot of, made a lot of effort in terms of improving my lighting and trying to generally learn as much as I can. Uh, in that department, Creative Life has been extremely helpful. I've followed a lot of the courses online and it's, it's been fantastic. Um, now, I struggle with posing and locations. Posing in the sense that I learned a little from practice but I need to have a method, a system, so I know I'm going to nail it every time. And in terms of location, I'll sometimes get to a location and see a nice design element, and I know there's a picture in there somewhere. There's something good if I can just incorporate this, but somehow it doesn't quite work out. Why is that? And so that's what I'm hoping to get out of this, and that's what I know I'm going to get out of this. And I'd like to thank Creative Life and Roberta for choosing me to be here. Like I said, thank you so much for coming. So thank you for that, David. Um, let me explain. First of all, this location stuff that we're talking about, it's, it's going to be the most fun ever because you're gonna, we're going to break down locations and we're going to make sense out of a very chaotic situation. So when you walk into any situation and it, it's like just chaotic because you have about two million little stimuli going on at every location, right? It's like how do you separate what you don't need from what you do need. How do you create the best photos from this place? Uh, I'll talk about what I'm going to teach about next, but I wanted to introduce a little bit about myself. I'm Roberto Valenzuela. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I'm sure you already know that. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to share a, a bit of a story that I, I usually don't share too much, but I think this is a good time to share it uh, just because of what I'm going to be teaching. And I want people to know where I come from more than just a quick because the story is so interesting. Um, then you can see why I, I have, there's so much drive in, 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 in my head and why I fight so hard to, to do things and not. I, I, I try to be an excuseless person. I don't have excuses for anything. I just try to make solutions. It sounds cheesy, but I, I just don't have excuses for anything. If I'm failing, it's because I'm failing, not because of the economy. Does that make sense? Um, when I was in high school, I, I was not quite an American citizen yet, not quite as an understatement, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, but that's not because we like, came into the country or nothing like that. We came into the country legally, but things that happened while we were here turned us into, uh, my dad put us in, in public schools um, he wasn't allowed to put us in public schools. We were supposed to be in only private schools. And we were in private schools, but then we were put into public schools for some reason, and my dad, because of that, my dad broke the law, and that we became illegal right away. So we became, we went from being allowed to be here to illegal. But point is, um, I was only 10 years old, so it's not like I know what illegal even means. But I was just kind of like rolling with it. Uh, we came here for personal matters that I won't go into, but um, once we arrived, we were in, we were in uh, school, in elementary school and junior high, and everything happened. And right around when I was in high school, um, 
I had really good grades in, in my last three years of school, my last two years of school. I really wanted my life to get back together. I was not doing well my freshman year. I was like lost and not a very good per per person back in the day. And my junior and senior year, I really, I really turned it around. And uh, I turned it around because I joined the cross country team, which is, which is uh, I've been in cross country all my life, like long distance running. But the people do, that do long distance running are usually like the nerds, right? Like the geeks of the school. So they're like they're all the smart ones, you know? And so I, I, I got surrounded by all these people. And these people influenced my, my life. And they made me want to get good grades and turn things around. And uh, because of that, I was very college bound. Like now that I got all these AP classes and I got a really good GPA and all this stuff, I was ready to go to college. Um, I, had a, I had an opportunity to be in this competition, political competition. I, I, I love politics. And I, I, I won my political competition in my high school. And so they, they sent me to compete against the top political students in the state. And I competed against them. I ran for office. I, I did the speeches. I did everything. I had to have my, my whole cabinet and everything going on. I had a, a campaign manager, the whole nine yards. Point is, there was 500 students in the state of Arizona that were competing against me. And those were the top 500. And two were chosen out of those to, to go to Washington, D.C. and compete against the top two of every state in the whole nation. And so when I, sh uh, long story short, I won that nomination and I was one of the two people from Arizona. And I flew to Washington, D.C. And all the people that were competing against me were like sons of senators and stuff, like real senators. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, like, I'm going to get killed. And I'm from Mexico. <laughs> you know, like, this is not going to work. Um, at the, end of the, at the end of that week, I ended up winning that national one as well. And I was invited to go meet with the President of the United States, uh, like to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him. And I flew to the White House. I, I was going to fly to the White House and have this whole meeting with Bill Clinton. And because he wanted to meet me, he wanted to meet because he met the President JF Kennedy when he was my age in the same program. He got to meet JFK in the same program that I was meeting Bill Clinton on. So because of all this, I got a presidential nomination to the United States Air Force Academy. And I also got a full ride to University of Arizona, Northern Arizona, all the, all the Arizona schools. I could just pick the school and it, would have been, it was going to be a full ride, right? Then, turns out, I'm from Mexico and I'm still not legal. So they took everything away from me. My presidential nomination was gone. Uh, I, I, they, uh, I actually almost didn't even get to meet the president because I wasn't allowed to. So it turns out I went to meet the president. They allowed me to be there. And I was shaking his hand. I, I talked to him for a while. We discussed everything. And um, I, was told, I told him that I was on fire and I was ready to go for the US Air Force Academy. Turns out when I went back, I got a letter that my nomination was all taken away and all my scholarships were all taken away. And I said, so now how do I go to college? And so we went to court to get, we had court scheduled. The judge at the courtroom said, um, you will be allowed to go to college, but without scholarships, without grants, without financial aid. And the best part is, we will not give you permission to work in the United States. And then they said, good luck. And I was just like, oh, you do not know who you're messing with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, you bring it on. <laughs> you know? But the fire that I had to go to college, having all these opportunities and then having everything taken away from me, builds a bit of a fire inside of you. See what I mean? So it turns out um, I was going to church, and my church had a band full of Brazilian guitarists. And one of them came up to me. I mean, I went up to one of them, and I told them that I have to find a way to. This was like in April. Um, yeah, it was like in April. And I said to him, I need to find a way to make money to pay for my tuition for college. And it was very expensive. And I can't work. So McDonald's, no, McDonald's or, or any of that would, would not even be an option for me. So then he says, you should teach guitar lessons. And I was like, that's true. And then he said, I charge like $10 an hour. And I was like, $10 an hour? That's $5 an hour more than McDonald's. So I said, oh my god, I was totally pumped up on fire. I'm going to teach guitar lessons. But then I forgot I don't know how to play the guitar. And I don't know, I don't even own a guitar. You know what I mean? 
So I said, like, it was like this like, dream, and then it was like reality check. Like, you don't even play the guitar. You don't even own one. You never have. <laughs> so I had to figure out a way to, uh, I, got a, I got a small guitar. It was like $30, and it was a classical guitar, nylon strings. They were it was cheap. And uh, I asked my friend, my friend Dustin in Tucson, to come and so see if he could help me. He was a, a classical guitarist. He came over, taught me one lesson, and then he came over the next week, taught me another lesson that was only like an hour long. And then I was so ready to pay for college. I don't know what it took. I don't, I don't care what it would take. I was going to pay for college before the summer was over. I, I had to pay for college in August. It was April. So long story short, as soon as I, he gave me these books, and he goes, you need to learn how to read music. You need to learn how to understand music theory. You need to understand how to do chords. And you need to know how everything comes together, and it's going to take you like 10 years. And I was just like, I have three months. <laughs> I have two months because I have to start teaching guitar so I can make the money. Um, to make a, a very long story short, I was working on my guitar literally, literally 50 hours a, a week, um, trying to get, become good enough so I could go play. I mean, I could go teach. A month and a half went by, I went to a, a, a music store, and I was playing the guitar, and it sounded really beautiful. <laughs> and the owner of the store came up to me and said, you are selling guitars by just playing the guitar. You need to be teaching for us. I was just like, I do need to be teaching for you. <laughs> and I decided to charge $12 a half an hour, $24 an hour, because I had to hurry up. I didn't have time to go for $10 an hour anymore. So then he said, um, OK. I, uh, I went to the, they were opening a new store, and I became the head guitar teacher at this store. <laughs> that was by luck, by the way. But after this, students started coming in, and I had to start teaching. Uh, two and a half months later, I paid my tuition for the University of Arizona. <laughs> and that was pretty awesome, because I just, when I paid my check, and I was going to go to college, I was the happiest human being on earth. This is why I am an excuseless person. There is no excuses for anything or anyone. Um, then I, I, I had to, uh, I ended up teaching guitar and becoming a professional concert guitarist for 10 years of my life. Now, I'm gonna click. That's me playing in front of an entire orchestra. And there was, I don't know, 700 people in the audience. And if, it, it's a, it was a guitar concerto, so if you make a mistake, the whole concerto goes out the window. And there's like 100 instruments in the background, and they're all listening to you, and you are the one that the beat is on. So if you make a mistake, if you slip up and you, you stop, everyone has to stop. And it would have been a total disaster. What does that mean? It means you have to prepare. It means you have to prepare in a way that when you do perform, you're not guessing. You are a master of your domain. <laughs> You are, and, that's, and I mean that literally, you are a master. Your mind can anticipate the finger movements before they even happen. Because if your fingers have to move from the top to the bottom, and you, you start thinking about it when you already have to move, it's too late. You're playing seven, six, seven, eight notes per second. So my mind is about two seconds ahead, while my fingers are catching up, and my brain is always two seconds ahead, and I'm flying through it with all these instruments. The only way to get through that is to prepare like no one else's business. Now, in, in music, you have the staff, and you have, you have little, they're called measures, little pieces of, the parts of the staff are called measures. Each little measure, I, you practice the finger movements for every little measure, and you put it on a little metronome. I don't know if you guys know what a metronome is. The little tick-tack, 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 tick-tack thing. Well, that sound is in my ears forever, 10 years of listening to that. Those little movements have to be so refined and so well made that when you are nervous, it doesn't affect your fingers whatsoever. When you are sweaty and you haven't eaten and there's pressure, like you have, you're not feeling well, your fingers can go right through it. And that's what a professional photographer should be able to do. This is the difference between people who like photography and people who really want to become photographers, OK? And photography is complicated. It's as complicated as music. There's no difference. 
And it hurts me, and, it, and it, it's the worst when, when photographers become photographers, and they go to their jobs, and that's, their, that's where they practice. Can you imagine if I performed, if I, if I got on that stage, and that was when I was starting to play my C scales? Well, by the time you get to the performance, you already are, you, you're supposed to already be a master of what you do. It means when, when things don't go right, you have answers. See what I mean? And when things go right, you blow it out of the water. It means that we have to make a decision about what kind of, how serious we want to take our photography. We all want to be good, but most of us don't put the time or effort to really what it takes to be good. <laughs> and I have news for you and for you and for everyone listening in the world. There is no shortcuts to photography. It is hard, I right, repeat, hard work. And you have to make a decision, am I going to take that leap and I'm gonna put the, put, the, put the time and effort, or am I just gonna keep showing up at events and that will be my practice session? Because if that's you, you're gonna be at the same level for the next 30 years of your life. And when things don't, when the economy tanks and stuff, and you just can't, you can't separate yourself from the rest of the competition, you are gonna go out of business and you will blame the economy because you don't blame yourself, right? We never blame ourselves. We blame something else. It's the economy that's really tanking. That's why I'm suffering. But if you were the best in your city and your photos were black and white, not black and white in color, but they were just like night and day in comparison to your competition, people will not only pay you, they will do whatever it takes. They will need to have you instead of want to hire you. Okay, let me repeat that. The difference will be your clients will just say, I need to have Nikki Closer shoot my wedding. I need it. It doesn't matter what the price is. I need it. If I don't have Nikki, I'll postpone my wedding. I don't even want to get married. Like, or, by the way, this is not a wedding workshop. This is a posing workshop, right? It doesn't matter if you're fa shooting fashion, senior portraits, or anything. If your work stands out, like clearly, you will continue to get hired regardless of the economy. I get hired all the time regardless of the economy. Who cares? And if people don't hire me in the US, well, maybe another country has a booming economy and people get married there too and they fly me there. When your work is so far out there, people will just hire you no matter what happens. But you gotta put the time, okay? Um, so this is what I was gonna ask you. Are you sure you wanna be a photographer? <laughs> and what I wanna ask you is, Seriously, because now after what I said, it puts a different twist. Photography is not buy cool equipment and go out there and have fun with your new lenses. It's not just playtime, even though it is fun. You know what's really fun is when you do have a camera and you're also really good at how to handle it, at how to, how to handle the scene and how to handle people, then you can really play. You see what I mean? Um, seriously, it's because everyone out there listening I want them to ask themselves, am I serious about this? Because if I am, I'm gonna have to put the work. There are no shortcuts, and I don't believe in talent. I wasn't even a, photog I wasn't even a photographer when I was a guitarist. How come when I was a, a guitarist, nobody told me, you are such a naturally born photographer? You know why they didn't tell me that? Because I wasn't a photographer back then. And when I was, in, when I was a guitarist, people never said, when I was a guitarist, people said like, Oh, you are so naturally born at the guitar. I was like, did you know that I practice 50 hours a week with my little metronome click, 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 going crazy all day long? Did you know that talent wasn't even in the picture? Yes, I have fingers. That doesn't mean I have talent. You know, we all have cameras. That doesn't mean we have talent. Talent doesn't even exist in my mind. I think it's there. You have some tendencies that are some easier for people than others. But talent, to me, it's an excuse we give ourselves to excuse ourselves for not being as good as somebody else. It's like we say he's talented, that's why I'm never gonna be as good as him because that's why I don't have to work hard because that person's talented, I'll never get to that point. So I don't believe in talent, I don't think talent exists, I think hard work exists. And if you want to really learn something, you can. And we're gonna spend three days 
exponentially increasing your skill level in, in, in photography, exponentially, because it's going to be tough. And this is going to be the groundwork for when you all go home to continue doing what we did in these three days and blow your peers out of the water, blow yourself out of, out of the water, and best of all, blow your expectations and your clients out of the water. Okay? What does a photography mean to you? So, Nikki, let me ask you, when you have a job, let's say you have a job in two weeks, what does that mean to you? Do you have a job? Does it mean money? I, I have money now, I have a job. Does it mean I have a pretty bride, I'm gonna take some pretty pictures? Does it mean what? Go ahead. Um, first time on the spot. Um, <laughs> the first of many. You know, I think it's a combination of things. It's, 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 it's a challenge to make sure that I am giving my clients the best possible photographs that capture their moments and their emotions. And um, it, it means money, absolutely. I have bills to pay. Um, it means that I have a lot of work to do to prepare for the job. Um, it means I'm excited and I'm having so much fun and I can't wait to do it. I mean, I, I don't, it just, it's, it's everything. It, I think that I, you have to throw your life into your job if, if you're going to be the best you can possibly be. Yeah. Um, that's good. It is a combination of different feelings. To me, when I have a job, like right now it's uh, the 3rd of September. What's the date? 6th. The 6th? Phew. The 6th of September, right? So let's say I have a job the 12th of September. A job to me means an opportunity to create new mistakes and learn from them. So I always push myself during the week and then I test those things at the weekend, at, at, the, work, at the job, and then I'm ready to fail at those new things I'm trying to do. And then when I do fail, I will know what it takes to solve those issues. To me, every job I do is like another opportunity to try something new, create new mistakes, embrace them, learn from them, capitalize from them, and then keep going. And then the next job, have another set of mistakes I'm ready to make. What I try to avoid making is the same mistakes I made last week. That's why we have the weekdays. That's why we have Mondays through Fridays, to get rid of those mistakes. If you're having problems with posing, fix it Monday through Friday. Don't wait till Saturday when it's already another job, right? Um, Here's one that, this is one of the things, you know, going around kind of in the industry a little bit, and I wanted to kind of discuss it. I want to ask you, are you performing at a, at a wedding or at a portrait shoot or a senior portrait or a fashion shoot? Are you performing or are you hoping? And by that I mean a performance means it's something that you prepared for and you're performing it already. And hoping is when you're not prepared, but you just really hope something turns out okay, <laughs> right? When you're just like, I have to do something, I, I, if I shoot enough frames per second, there will be one or two good ones in there. Okay, that's not, so when I, when I show up at a wedding, I have worked very hard to feel like I'm performing what I already worked on. But a lot of people, I feel like show up to a wedding hoping something good comes out of it. And I don't hope, I know it's gonna work out because I prepared. You know what I mean? I put the hours, I put the time. I went through my, I went through my, bad, my, my bad photos during the week that, that I took at my job, and I, studied, I put them in a folder, and that folder is like my gold folder. Like I don't, that folder is like the, the seed to my new learning, because I made those mistakes because I have a lack of learning, a lack of knowledge on that particular area. And how do you know what your lack of knowledge is if you never look at your bad photos? Because when we, when we, um, when we pull the photos from a job, we look at the best ones, we pull them, we start them with five, five stars, we, we separate them, we Photoshop them, we clean them up, we straighten them, we color correct them, and then we send them to our clients and we, we pat ourselves on the back and we move on to the next job. And you, you missed out on the best part of the world. You just, you missed out on all your bad photos, the photos where you screwed up on, because that's the, that's, that's what holds the key to your new knowledge. You do not want to let that go. Because new knowledge means bookings, means improvement, means money at the end of the day. Means who cares if the economy tanks or not? Who cares if Mitt Romney wins or not? Who cares? Because you're going to be okay. See what I mean? So during Creative Life, which is awesome, woo, look at all you guys. <laughs> it's so funny. 
We're going to solve the problems that most photographers have. We're going to look at a location, and we're going to basically train our eyes, and I'm going to pick on all of you, and you in the audience, you can do the same. I'm going to pick on you, and I'm going to say, where are the gifts that this location is giving you? Every location has little hidden gifts, just like a scavenger hunt. I'm looking around this room, and like little gifts are popping out of my eyes. And I'm like, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. See what I mean? You look at this room, and you may have other gift ideas. Or you may not see any gifts at all. OK? Or you may go for the obvious gift, like there's a fireplace. I will pose the bride by the fireplace, because it's, a, it's the easiest one, right? But it doesn't do anything. So we're going to break down locations in a way that is going to give you the, the tools to make sense out of any situation, whether you're indoors or outdoors, OK? The next. This is huge, body dynamics for confident posing. I'm not going to teach you how to pose people, because that means you, let's say I teach you 10 poses, then what happens when you want to get out of that? What happens when the 10 poses are for women and you're posing a guy? It doesn't, see what I mean? What happens if the guy is like a different body shape and those poses don't work? I'm going to teach you body dynamics, which means I'm going to show you how the body works, it doesn't matter what, as long as you have legs and a spinal cord and a neck and a head, we're going to study those body parts so we can build, not learn new poses or memorize them, but we're going to be building our own poses. That's the difference. We're not memorizing pose one, two, three, four, five. We're going to be learning the structure of body dynamics so you can make your own poses. And now you have unlimited poses to choose from because you can just do whatever you want. As long as you understand this, it will always look good. OK, so that's the best part. We're going to talk about once you understand how to break down locations, and once you understand how to pose, and once you understand body structure and dynamics and all of that, then you screw everything up if you don't understand execution of lighting, lenses, and angles. The wrong angle on someone destroys a perfectly good location and a perfectly good pose. OK, the wrong lens, same thing. But most importantly is the angles that you choose to shoot from. We're going to be discussing angles all the time here. I'm actually going to take photos of the models with bad angles just to show you how horrible that beautiful model will look. OK? And in two seconds, we're going to fix the angle. We're going to make her look like a supermodel. OK? And the best part, which is what Kenna said, we're going to go about how to learn. So when you get out of here, you're not stuck with only what you learned here. You can continue to improve on your own. OK? So next time somebody says, I am a wedding photographer or I am a portrait photographer, people will respect you as a true professional, not as a person who just went to Costco and bought a camera and now you're a photographer. See what I mean? This industry will be much more respected because the level of work that we're going to provide people when we call ourselves professional photographers is going to mean something. It's going to be leaps and bounds, Uncle Bob, with a camera. OK? And of course, at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about the monetizing of skills. OK? How to get all this and turn that into some sort of money to pay our bills and feed our kids. OK, um, I want to talk about. I wanted to add this because this is very important. The language of photography to convey what you want to say. Mm, I chose these words carefully. The language of photography because to me, posing is like vocabulary words. But without the grammar, you have no structure on how to use the poses. Does that make sense? So let's say, Pepe, you, you know three poses. It's like you learning, it's like you knowing three words in Greek. And once you, and when somebody talks to you past those three words, you are now lost. When, when you have a person who you can, uh, posing and stuff like that, memorizing poses is not going to help you. Because it's like memorizing three words in Greek. You want to be able to handle the language in a way that you can create your own conversations. Okay? So, my goal for you, and this is going to sound rough, my goal for you is I don't want to inspire you. I could care less. <laughs> because inspiring means you're pumped up for like a short period of time, and then you go home, 
and everything goes out the window. But you were really pumped up for like 10 seconds, <laughs> right? Like when I go to the WGPI and I see people get out of that room, they're like, I'm pumped. <laughs> and I'm like, and then like at lunch, they don't even know why they were pumped for. <laughs> <laughs> They're totally like, they were inspired for like two seconds, they, they cry and everything, it's all oh, it's very inspirational. And then when they have a photo shoot in front of them, they're like, oh man, that didn't do, any, do, they don't, they didn't do me any good. What I don't, I don't want to inspire you, I don't want to inspire anyone watching online. I don't care. I want to encourage you to take action, to make something during your weekdays, to give you the encouragement, like just, the, the heat in your heart that says, I want to do this. I want to go out and try this. I want to make new mistakes. I want to look at my, my, my bad photos and learn from them. I want to know where I can be in a year if I do this. That's encouragement. That's why I never care for inspirational, in, in, inspiration stuff, okay? Okay, this is my knowledge database when I was learning photography. This is where I used to be. So I push myself, I try new techniques, right? Once you push yourself, I fail, because that's the next thing. If it's new, you're going to probably fail. Right, David, my friend? After you fail, you're going to learn, because learning comes from failing. And after you learn, you're going to evolve yourself, and you're gonna be expanding your database of knowledge. This circle should be never ending for you, never ending. Because when you start out, your knowledge database is a puny little dot like this. You know, three poses. Kiss, hold hands, and kiss. <laughs> Everybody, let's go to the fountain, because there's a fountain in the park. Let's kiss in front of the fountain. Everybody, there's a really pretty tree over there. It's coming to me. Let's, let's wait, wait, I see the bit. Let's kiss in front of the tree. Let's kiss. <laughs> You know, how about we hold hands and walk? <laughs> how about we just hold hands and then you look at each other and get lost in your eyes? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. These are your three vocabulary words in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you go, this is when you freak out, you go to your comfort zone. You're like, ah, comfort zone, kiss, hug, kiss. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is what you gotta do. Where's the fountain? There's no fountain here, I'm lost. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. If you do that, if you do this process, you push yourself throughout the week to, to create new techniques. Let's say off-camera flash, reflector. Oh my gosh, you guys are gonna have an overload of stuff by the end of three days. <laughs> uh, you fail. When you fail, you recognize where the failure is. And you write it down. You make a note, why did I fail here? You're going to learn and you're going to evolve. And if you do that, your knowledge database it's gonna get bigger. And now you have kiss, hug, kiss, hold hands, walk, fountain, fountain <laughs> side, park, tree, dog, <laughs> fireplace, piano. Go like this on top of the piano, <laughs> right? And then you're going to push yourself, you're going to fail, you're going to embrace the failure, you're going to learn, you're going to evolve, and then your knowledge database will be that big. Now, that, now this is your comfort zone. When you go shoot a wedding, whether it's an Indian wedding, a Persian wedding, a whatever wedding, your knowledge database is so big, you will be able to just pull from a thousand different things, build your own language of photography, and just speak to people in the language of photography, and it, your photos will look like poetry. Does that make sense? So we're going to embrace new mistakes and prepare, avoiding, re avoid repeating them. Today, I'm gonna force you to make a mistake, and then I'm also tr gonna try to push you to not make the mistake again. And when, when you make another mistake, we're gonna do that again. Okay, we're gonna, I'm also gonna put you in a situation that's out of your comfort zone, and you're going to learn, you're going to fail, you're going to evolve, okay? Uh, kind of like the guy in South Park, uh, Mr. Garrison, okay, okay, right? I watch that work all the time. <laughs> Take a look at this real quick. Um, the English, 
the English language has approximately 750,000 words. Now, what happens, what if you knew the 750,000 words? Do you know what to do with them? If you don't know grammar, you have no structure, right? You just have a bunch of words. So the structure of the English language comes, in, comes from eight parts of speech. Within those eight parts of speech, you can put all those words, and now you have sentences. Now you can talk the language, right? Look at all this stuff. This stuff here is the structure, the architecture of where to place those words in what order to create a sentence. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When you go out, or even here, when you look at this carpet, when you look at the floor, when you look at the walls, these are all words. I'm going to try to give you the framework to make sense out of all of this and create sentences that people can understand. Because if you look at a photograph that has a lot of stuff going on, people won't understand and they, they won't pay you for it. Okay? We start out, when we start out with photography, it's kind of, this is obviously an analogy, right? If we start out with photography, we start out speaking in slang. Like this is how you talk in kind of slang terms. After you learn the structure and proper grammar and you know how to put the words, you start speaking with complete sentences because you know what the words are. But it's only when you know what the words really mean, like the true meaning of a word, and you master those words that you understand, and now you can create poetry. And when someone speaks English that's so refined, it sounds like poetry, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound so beautiful? You're like, like when Barack Obama speaks or something, it's like, oh. Yeah. Just sounds so good. Whereas when Mitt Romney speaks, it's like, bleh. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Susan's mad at me now um, for bringing in politics. Just kidding. <laughs> OK, so we're going to try. We're not going to be satisfied speaking in complete sentences in photography. We're going to be satisfied when we can create poetry. OK? That's what we're going to do. When your photos look like everyone else's photos, it's because you're just doing complete sentences. But when your photos look like a work of art, you're creating poetry with photography. To check out this guy, the music framework. All the music in the world, well, not really the Eastern world, all the music in the Western world was created by using just those 12 notes. That's it. If you combine those 12 notes and you put them in different order and you, pay, you make them in different lengths of time, you can create all the music in the world. Or, sorry, in the Western world. Because in Asia they have like microtones and you don't want to get into that. Okay? So, now that you have these notes, if I give you a piano and I say, here are the 12 notes, play Mozart, symphony number no. five, you're not going to be, you're going to be like, what the heck do I do with these 12 notes? You have the tools, you don't know what to do with them. It's like saying, you have your flash, you have your lens, you have your camera, you don't know what the hell to do with them. It's the same type of thing. But you are going to combine them to make something, to make, to make poetry. This is, the, this is the structure of music. Once you have those 12 notes, you're going to have theory, you're going to have structure of how the notes are going to go, you're going to have harmony when you have three notes or more, and you're going to have an architecture that's going to make the, the, the notes sound like music. Just like you're going to have your cameras, your lenses, and your flashes, and your reflector, be, make music in, 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 a, in a pose, OK? These are all the types of music that you can play. Um, even music like blues and classical, I mean, these two could not be more different from each other, all came from those 12 notes of, of, uh, of music, which means with the, with the tools that you can have with, with photography, you can create your own style of photography. You don't have to copy my style or copy this other photographer's style. You are going to have the tools and you can make, you want to play new, new age, you want to play jazz, you want to play blues, you can do it with the tools, but you're going to do it really well. You're going to do it like poetry. Okay? With a couple of people, I'll just read you a quick comment. Um, this is Jill Adams. This is fabulous. I bought your book several months ago and it has been transformational. I've been practicing and rereading and loving my improvements. Um, I will, this is great, I will buy it at the first break. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, I have a question so. from Jackie. Thank you for buying my book. What's Oh, sorry. I have a question from Jackie Photo in New Jersey, I think. Um, what if you have another full-time job or go to school or volunteer? Would you say s someone shouldn't be in the photography business if they don't have time to practice? No, of course not. When I was teaching guitar, I was also going to school. Like, you can make time. My, uh, 
my, my little sessions that I do during the week sometimes last five to 10 minutes. It's just that I do them. That's the difference. There is no, uh, people have kids, like you have like 20 kids, like you have three kids, right? You have three kids, like people have kids and people, everyone's busy. But we also waste time, no matter how busy we are. And I mean, you can go about this in so many angles. If you spend three hours editing your photos, maybe try taking them really well so you don't have to edit them so much. That will free up one hour that you could use for something else, for maybe working on your on something new, okay?